Awesome. All right. Uh, let me get back to the beginning of this chapter. So um, I was kind of excited to do this chapter because, like I said earlier, the um, the meta programming section of this book is like was the main reason why I really kind of wanted to read this book because I I do some of that and I struggle with it. <laughs> so I was kind of excited to have a chance to do like the big picture chapter, and then I think I'm also doing not next week but the quasi quotation coming up simply because I really want to kind of have to figure this out. So the big picture is pretty much. Hopefully, like, you'll be here next week as well because I'm presenting next week and it's going to be over my head. So you're going. Oh, I'm excited! Yeah, no, I'll definitely be here. I'm not missing any of these if I can possibly avoid it. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> um, I mean, I think this is like kind of weird stuff, right? So it's like probably over all of our heads, you know. So that's why we're here. Um, so the big picture chapter is really about like sort of setting the ground so a little bit so we can get some terminology and we can kind of think about some of these broader ideas and then we'll kind of dive into like how do we use them in particular so I think some of this week might feel a little bit like wait what and then there's a lot of oh and we'll do that next week so we weren't going to come out of this chapter understanding all of this stuff perfectly but we're hopefully having um, some ideas that we'll fill in the blanks as we go forward um, so I thought the learning object objectives for this week were to become familiar with some of the metaprogramming principles and how they relate to each other and also review vocabulary. We are using the Arlang and the Lobster packages this week. Um, a lot of these things I think do have our ba like base equivalents, um, but the Arlang is just a little bit more straightforward. So first is this idea, and I love this idea, the idea that code is also data. And to me that then follow is that code is you can manipulate the code and um, that's kind of the important part about metaprogramming so we have one of our terms is an expression and that is like the code that you're capturing um, that could be a call a symbol a constant or a pair list um, we're going to use our lang the ex expression i'm going to call it the expression i know it's express <laughs> but i'm going to call it the expression function um, th this one does have uh, the b quote equivalent in in base uh, and that's what we can use to capture code directly. And for me, when I say directly, I mean like you 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 wrap it directly around the code. It's not getting the code from anywhere else. So if we use the ex expression function, we can capture this function call here as an expression. If we want to capture it indirectly, so we want to actually do we pass through something else and then grab it, like a function. If you had like we're creating a function where you wanted to capture like a user input of code, we'd use the n expression. Um, here uh, to capture that. Um, and they were saying that it ought, you can think of this as it automatically quotes the first argument and hopefully we'll have a better understanding of what that means in the next couple of weeks. Um, so in this case, we can create a function that allows us to capture expressions being passed through it. Um, and then the whole cool part about this, once you capture this code, we can start modifying it. Now I've done this in the past in a really messy way where I like kind of like paste things together. Um, has anyone ever used the, the get function? Um, the get function is a way to like get a function by its name using text. And so I that's like, I think that's getting into like metaprogramming a little bit. Um, so for example, the get function is, you is can- That's similar to like get anywhere. I've used get anywhere. Um, uh, I think it might- so, Get, for example, you can do this. Um, you need one more point. Yeah. Which essentially gets the mean function, but it returns it as an active function that you can use. So if you if you run just get mean, you get the little function display um, like information at the bottom here. Uh -huh. And so then you can just put your your the values you want to take the mean of inside that function right there. And so I've used the get function before to grab um, functions by character names. Um, so once we've captured our code, we can start modifying it. And the thing to import, uh, to remember here is that cap like expressions are, um, you can modify them as if they're a list. So if you have a function um, here, like for this example here, we're capturing this function f. I realize I shouldn't have called it f because it's confusing, but bear with me. Um, where we've got this function f that has an argument x equals one and argument y equals two, we can capture it. Then we can use the names function to kind of look at it. We can see that the first element is always the function and it doesn't have a name in this list. 
Um, and the, but the arguments do. So we have got an X and a Y. So just to kind of illustrate how we can work with this, I created a bunch of copies. So this is essentially like a shorthand to say, I want to create an object called FF and an object called FFF, and they are both assigned to F. So we've got now three Fs that are three different copies of this expression that we've captured up here. Um, let's take the second one, so FF, and we're going to, we can change the argument Z because we can refer to it by name. Um, we can actually add in Z as an argument and set it to having a value of three. We can change the uh, the second argument here, so we can call it by position, and we can remove it by assigning it to null. And this is kind of what we are working with when with lists, like way way back. Um, and now, if we kind of compare our three expressions that we've mod we haven't modified the first one. So if we look at the first expression, it's just what we had originally, um, a, a function with two arguments. If we look at the second one. We have now we've added this new argument z. And if we look at the third one, we've actually removed the argument x. And so we can capture and modify then this code before it gets evaluated, which is sort of, I think, the heart of metaprogramming. And we're going to do more on this next week. Looking forward to it, Joe. Um, another thing to kind of think about um, is it's for me in a way, and it helps to kind of think of this as being a list because I feel like a lot of the principles we've just used were like applying to a list. And this one is also, you can think of it as the way a list looks when you sort of print it in your R console. And that's the idea that code is really like a tree and it's called an abstract syntax tree, AST. And apparently every, almost every programming language represents code as a tree. And we can use the AST function from Lobster to kind of inspect these code trees. Um, so for example, if we had this nested piece of code here, um, we could use the AST function to kind of pull out the different pieces. And that applies to, I forget what these kinds of functions are called, the, the non- the Infix operators. Yeah, thank you, the infix operators. Um, and that also applies because there are they you can write them this way, but you can also write them as like the function back. You can write them as tactic, tactic, y as well. So for me, it's one of those analogies where it works now. I'm not sure if it'll work forever, but um, I like to think of this as a list because that helps me because I can think of this as being like a nested list of functions here. So we've got our first one on the outside, then we got the F2 with two arguments and F3 with its one argument. What I, what I liked about this diagram is it reminded me of backtraces and errors and like it matched mm -hmm. directly onto that. And I realized like, ah, okay, now... This is starting to make, these are starting to mesh, like, yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. I hadn't even thought about that, but you're right. That's exactly kind of the notation that backtraces use. Um, cool. Okay. So, um, sort of next sort of code principle is that we've covered, like, code is data. Code is a tree, um, but also code can generate code. <clears throat> So if we use the call to our uh, function, we can essentially use a function to create a function. And I believe here we're actually, we're creating a function, like, like an expression of a function. So if we call it F, give it our arguments, we're kind of like going backwards from, uh, from this section here. We're almost like kind of looking at this and then, um, uh, maybe not, maybe don't think about that analogy. It works for my, in my head, but then as soon as it starts saying, I'm like, I'm not sure that works anymore. Um, anyway, so we've got a, a function call that uh, we're sort of creating an expression of using the call to function. Um, we can also think of going backwards from that tree, which could, we can use these functions to create calls. So if we were thinking about this tree here and we want to recreate this function call, we can do that with this nested so series of function calls, sorry, of expressions as well. Um, and the same for the infix operators. There's also the- Real quick, real, yeah. real quick, are the, the A's and B's in that should, should um, are they arguments? And if so, should they not be in quotes? Uh, that's a good point, actually. So one is a value, and you're right here, right. let's try this. 
it seems like that would make the values of A and and I do apologize. Most of these slides I prepared like two weeks ago. So I'm trying to remember <laughs> what it was I, I decided on two weeks ago. Let's try that. Uh, an object A not found. Hmm. Ah, okay. So we can do it if we assign them as arguments. Let's see, what did we have here? But we maybe previously oh. they were they were not variables, but just um, character strings or whatever. Is that why they're in quotes? Mm. Yeah, so I think the thing is that you it doesn't really make sense. Okay, here we go. Sorry, I was thinking about um, in this example, It's actually interesting because in this example, we're actually referring to two objects that haven't actually been created in the environment yet. Right. So we're saying the A is not the name of the argument. A is the what's being provided to the argument. Um, and same thing with one. And in this case, it looks like it actually requires um, because we're creating create, we're using these inputs to create an expression. I think the idea is that we could actually say, um, I wonder how we would unquote that. Maybe that's the next section here. Okay, I think- I, Yes, that's the next section. Thinking, there you go. <laughs> where I was confused is I was thinking of this as creating functions, but it's not creating functions. It's creating function calls. So you need to have the argument values uh, included. Yeah, because there'd be, you would never, you would never just give it the name of an argument without the value of an argument because that makes no sense because it would then look for it as if it was an object in your environment. Um, yeah, and where we're talking about, where I was trying to go with this is like, oh, well, could we give it, um, like A and B here, as an example here, could we give it A plus B as an argument for that function? And I think we can, if we now go to, um, if we now go to the, I'm quoting. So, sorry guys, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm getting myself confused here. Um, so we've got the bang bang operator. It's another one of those terms that I'm happy to now know the name of. <laughs> um, and this is the unquote operator. And it essentially in inserts like a previously defined expression into the current one. Because otherwise we get all, it's very hard to differentiate between what should be an expression and what's actually character, right? Because that's what we were kind of struggling with right here. These are now character. And if we put them in as unquoted, then R expects them to be an object. And so that's the problem here. So in this case, we can specify an expression of x plus x, and that's captured, an expression of y plus y, and again, that's captured. We can't then just say, oh, do x divided by y, because that's actually creating a new expression that isn't what we want. We want to actually put those objects in there, or the values of those objects. So in this case, we can use the bang bang operator to kind of take what those original expressions were representing and kind of insert them in here. Steffi, I have to say, this makes so much more sense with you explaining it than with Hadley explaining it in the book. I just want to, I just want to say that. <laughs> I'm because, very like, happy to hear I just that. Totally, I, did, I didn't get, catch this at all in the book. This makes sense to me. Thank you. So, yeah, well, it's funny. Sorry, go for it. I have a question, but you go first. Finish I was just going to say that I find this part it's something that I kind of go in circles a little bit in my head with. Um, and I have to keep reminding myself that, you know, the difference between something that's quoted and unquoted and in what I even think about quoted versus unquoted in my head is not, I think, necessarily the same thing that they're talking about. Um, but sorry, too many things. Um, and, you know, so I'm constantly having to remind myself, okay, when does something need to be quoted or not quoted? I feel like it's like when I first started learning R, right? It was like, that was like one of the biggest struggles. So it's like, does it need quotes or not? Um, anyway. Okay, so so yeah. my question is like this expression bang bang X divided by bang bang Y. What is it? Like, what does it do? Like, is it a function of X and Y? Like, can I then use it and plug in an X and plug in a Y? 
So the idea is like, let's assume that you wanted to build an expression, right? And you were like, oh, I've got this expression. Sorry, sorry. can we back up one second? Why do I yeah. want to build an expression? Because you want to do metaprogramming. Um, because you want to manipulate um, what will happen. So you want, so right now we're creating function calls. We're creating expressions. We're saying we want something to happen later. And then the next step will then to be evaluating these. So essentially right now we're manipulating code. Um, so so like metaprogramming would be like, I create this expression and then I put it into, for example, like a linear model, an LM and it's y tilde x1 plus x2 plus x3 mm -hmm. like that's the expression right that's one option yeah another thing is if you ever um so the reason why i want to know this stuff is because i write packages that use tidyverse a lot on the internal side which i mean a lot of people say you shouldn't do that but i mostly write data manipulation packages um and so i am going to use the tidyverse inside and i do occasionally um run into situations where we want to use the data masking inside a function. And that gets like really complicated. Um, and so that's one of those things where you want to kind of like capture these expressions without evaluating them until you're ready. Because if you evaluate them too early, the stuff doesn't exist yet or it's in the wrong context. And so these are, I think for me, you want to capture an expression because you want to have it ready to go, but not yet. And maybe you yeah. want to change it. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell but, me really quickly what data masking is? I'm sorry. Oh yeah, no worries. So, so you know, um, no, 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 it's all good. Uh, do you use the tidyverse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're using dplyr, R, or sorry, not dplyr, R, if you're using mutate from dplyr, R, you yeah. give it take your empty cars data set, right? Yeah. And then you can say cylinders is equal to cylinders plus one if you want, yeah. to, right? And the sure. this is data masking because you are allowed to refer to the columns as if they are objects in the environment, but they're not, right? In base, you can't you do that. In base, you'd have to do MT cars dollar sign, yeah. equal to MT car. You always yeah. have to tell our base where that object is because it doesn't exist outside of that data set. Right. Um, and so that's this is data masking. Um, if you look at mutate, uh, um, you'll notice that one thing, it was actually something I learned recently is that all sort of tidyverse functions that call or refer to a column either use data masking or tidy selectors. And knowing that you could just go look at the data um, and the documentation just to immediately data masking or tidy selectors helps you already kind of decide what format to use. Um, and so uh, we can click on data masking and it gives you some ideas here, but I, this reason why I'm doing this R book because I've never really totally understood all yeah. of this stuff here. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate. Yeah. It. No worries. Um. Anyway, back to the expression here. Um. So in this case here, we've got our expression x x, which so x x is like the the name or the handle for what we're ever, we're going to use to refer to x x, which is an expression. And we've got yy, which is another sort of name or handle referring to y plus y, that expression. These aren't being evaluated. They're just, they're ready to go. If we tried to evaluate them right now, we run into errors because I don't have x or y in my environment. So I wouldn't know how to do that. Um, but maybe we're still building and we still want to kind of create something more. And we can't just say, okay, well, let's use xx divided by yy. Because when we're creating expressions, we don't use quotes or anything. So how is it supposed to know what comes from the environment and what doesn't, right? So um, because X doesn't exist in my environment and that doesn't create an error, but it does create an expression. And so here, although XX exists in my environment, it always just assumes it's not there and it uses it directly as an expression. But that's where we can use these bang bang operators to unquote them into um, what, what they actually represent. And one thing to kind of point out is that that will give us an error if we do it here, because I don't have an XX in my environment. So it couldn't find object X here. So for me, I, I think of this as being like the difference between um, kind of whether or not you would put your object exists or not and, and what you're referring to. Um, and we, there is another sort of, um, 
it's sorry, sorry. So here's like an example of why you might want to use it. So let's say you're building an expression that takes like a, a variable as an expression from a user. And this would be something where you could absolutely kind of plug this into like a tidyverse pipe of, of, of data manipulation things. Um, and you're like, okay, well, I want them to give me a variable, but an unquoted variable, so an expression. We're going to grab that using our in expression function. Um, but then we want to like do something with that variable. We want to like put it together. We want to calculate um, the standard deviation divided by the mean. I think that's got a name, but um, oh, CV. Someone who does stats, remind me. What's that? Coefficient, coefficient of variation. variation. Thank you. Um, uh, we want to calculate the coefficient of variation, but the user just gives us a single variable, but it's unquoted, right? So this is that data masking idea. Um, and then, so we're going to put it together by bang banging, <laughs> unquoting those variables. And so now if we do CVX, we get an expression back um, that is appropriate for what we're trying to do. It's not evaluated yet, but this is like kind of part of a process. I used to do the whole paste thing, um, or I've done it in the past at least, uh, and it's a mess and it's, um, it is difficult. And apparently it's also problematic. And I put this quote in because I thought it was a kind of important thing to remember um, that, you know, you might think this doesn't really matter, but, you know, it, when you think about how much, you know, how many billions of dollars have been like spent on dealing with injection attacks with SQL, uh, sorry, SQL light inject injection attacks, hmm, maybe something to bear in mind. Um, Joe, I was also thinking too, whenever I've in the past tried to kind of run a bunch of linear models by, and then like putting in automatically the formula for those linear models, something has always really bugged me is that when you do the summary of the model or something like that, or you ever look at that model, that function call is sort of hidden because it looks like kind of how you created it. And uh, it's because I think I would use like pasting things together and then use the formula function to turn that all in. So I think this process would be a way to get around that with actually having an unquotable function call in that summary table that, that would then like be about um, relevant. I'm sorry. Yeah, it would actually be relevant. I've always gotten a little nervous about that because then you can't actually tell when you're looking at the results whether or not you had the right function in the first or formula in the first place. Okay. Um, so now that we've kind of talked about how we're building up our code and we're kind of building or sorry, our, our function calls, um, we're going to talk a little bit about what you're going to do once you've got this expression ready to go, how are you going to run it? Because that's obviously there's no point in building an expression if you're not actually going to run it. So we're another one of our terms is evaluate. So we're actually going to run or execute an expression. We're going to evaluate it. The thing, and I feel like we've been kind of building up to this over the past couple of weeks, is that we now need both an expression and an environment because we know that expressions refer to objects in the environment. So if we're going to say x plus y and we don't have an x or we don't have a y in our environment, um, then we'll get an error. Or which environment are we running this in so that we have which x and which y? And so we can use the evaluate function. And I'm trying to actually just double check. Uh, eval is a base function. So we can use the evaluate function. Whoops. Um, we can use the evaluate function and give it an environment, for example. So if we create the expression of x plus y, um, we can evaluate that expression and give it an environment that we choose whatever it is we want. And this gives you a lot of control over how and what happens to that expression. I think this is also, there are times where, especially if you're developing functions that users get to use, it really makes sure that everything is like neatly um, contained so that you're not worried about what the user may have created with, without your knowledge. But if you don't put that environment, then it looks for X and Y in your global environment. I think it does. Yeah. So if we look here, the eval is the parent frame by default. And so if you don't specify it, it will use the, the global. Well, well, maybe not the global, but the current, <laughs> wherever, yeah. wherever current it's being environment. the current. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I think we can see that when we go here and we say eval XX, we're going to get that same error. Um, when I tried to unquote them because I can't find XX or can't find X, excuse me. 
Um, so because we are choosing when to evaluate these expressions, it means that you can like be fancy about what the environment is. Um, but it also means that you can kind of customize it by, and this one, I mean, I don't know, this one scares me a little bit because it means that you can really get creative with customizing exactly what's going on. You can actually even change what functions are being called um, or what functions are being referred to, I should say. Um, because in an environment, you can bind names to, to different functions. So you can kind of overwrite how a, a base function normally works. Um, and apparently, if you, so I've used dplyr for working with SQL, um, mostly SQLite databases. And it, it it's kind of fun because it means that you just kind of work with the same, um, uh, like the same functions you're used to working for working with like a database in R or sorry, a data set in R you can use for SQLite. I've also used them for Apache Arrow or Parquet files and things like that. And so it's, it's kind of cool to have the exact same syntax. So apparently this is how dplyr does it under the hood is actually just sort of rewrites how those functions work or maybe assigns them to a different, um, I didn't look into it, so I'm not sure how it works, but apparently this is what it uses. Um, I had a lot of fun here with this one, modifying our string, creating a string math function that creates a new environment um, where we have changed what plus and what asterisk means. So normally these would be additive and uh, or addition and multiplication, um, but here we've turned them into things that uh, sort of repeat strings and paste strings together. And so when we give this, um, when we give string math an expression, so in this case, that uses sort of functions. So in this case, I'm saying hello plus cohort plus cohort, like with that, the value of nine, um, then we, it's actually going to paste the two pluses together. And so we get hello cohort nine, or cohort nine. <laughs> anyway, uh, the other thing we can do is we can give it uh, a multiplication. And so that actually does a string repeat. And so we can give it uh, the, the, we can add these things together and then we, it'll multiply them together. And this is not like, this makes no sense um, without overriding those functions. Um, I did take me a little bit of trial and error because I didn't really straight, straight, strictly understand exactly what I was doing the first time I was doing it. Uh, but it's kind of cool to think about how you can overwrite uh, how a function works. Okay, so so I'm totally cool with the overriding functions because you've done really great examples. But can we can we walk through the um the expression stuff just mm -hmm. um a tiny bit more? So the first line an e environment. This is just creating the environment. So if we go back uh, here, we are evaluating an expression with a particular environment. Uh huh. This is the same thing, just kind of expanded out. If we go down to the bottom here, we're evalu evaluating an expression with a particular environment. And E is this environment that we're defining up here. And we're changing the functions in the environment. Yeah. Yeah. And sorry, what's the difference between EXPR and ENEXPR? So the reason why we're using an expression here is because it's indirectly, uh, we're passing the expression to it indirectly. Um, if we were to do this, here, let me sort of, so if we were to not create a string math function and just do this, we would be using an expression and the expression would be that. I'm not, one, I think that should work. Let's see. So we would create our environment, E. I'm mm. gonna say nine to cohort. And then this is the expression here that we're using. Uh, I didn't like that, yeah, I was gonna wonder. And I think I'll do that. <laughs> I, I mean, let's see. Yeah, all right. And so I'm creating an expression um, saying hello plus cohort plus nine. And now we're gonna evaluate that expression with the environment we created up here, E. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, I get the hello cohort nine. It's because this is created inside of a function. And so in this function call, we're passing the expression, that's passing it indirectly, right? It's, this expression is not inside the 
the expression function immediately. It needs to get passed in as this argument x, and then x needs to be passed to the expression function. So when you're doing that, you use the n expression. A good rule of thumb is that if you're doing something, in, if the user is passing an expression as an argument, you're going to use n expression. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. That was okay. Great. Yeah, I wasn't, sometimes, you know, when you're, you think you got a handle on it, <laughs> explaining it, it's just like, let's see how I can do this. Good. <clears throat> Although I feel like I'm actually getting a lot more comfortable, even just having, going through it here now. I feel like I'm understanding a lot better now. All right, so the next thing, so we customize the evaluation by kind of changing the environment and changing the functions in the environment, but we can also customize the evaluation by changing the data. So um, this is this idea of data masking here. So if we're gonna look for variables inside of a data frame, a data mask is usually um, refer uh, refers to working with a data frame. Um, we're now going to use eval tidy rather than evaluate. I forget what the rationale for that was. Um, I feel like there was a rationale for that. Um, it's possible to use eval for this, but there are a few potential fit pitfalls, which we will cover um, in a couple of weeks. And so we're just going to use eval tidy. Okay, so we can think of eval tidy as just being the same thing as eval. And we'll deal with what the nuanced differences are in a couple of weeks. So we are evaluating um, this expression of x plus y given this data frame. And I looked up eval tidy because I was kind of curious what the arguments were. And that first argument is the data. And essentially, um, that's the data frame uh, that we are going to be creating a data mask with or using as a data mask. I'm not sure exactly how that terminology works there. But so fascinating yeah. that um, the data frame is not the first object, like, or the first argument, like it is in every, uh, you know, tidy command. I think it's because this is an evaluation command. And so the most important part about this one is the expression that you're evaluating. And then it's like the context within which you're evaluating that expression. Um, because this doesn't have to be a data. You don't actually have to give it data. Data can be null. And so I think with that, that's like you don't, um, I believe that if we were to use tidy eval with this, get rid of the data and put in E here, we get the same. It works exactly the same thing as the eval function. So tidy eval and eval are like the same. So that's why the data isn't necessary, it's, but we can give it the data. And if we give it the data, it assumes that this expression applies within the context of that data frame. So if we create a data frame with X and Y columns and then have an expression of X plus Y, but give it that data frame as a mask, then it will go inside the data frame and find those values and do the calculations for us that way. Okay, sorry I'm talking so much tonight today. Um... You're helping me a lot. <laughs> So like, I just had this, maybe this epiphany, but I, I want to just say it out loud. Is the data frame the environment? It's not, but it's it sort not. of is like. <laughs> I think that it's, it's like, it's like, it's not an environment. It, like it is because like the objects in the environment are like the columns in the data frame. That's very much how I think of it. Um. So I, I don't know if that's like accurate to a very technical sense, but it's definitely the way I think about it and, and the analogy I use in my head. So I think the kind of cool thing, this is actually kind of how a lot of tidyverse functions work, like it, maybe in a simplistic way, or if you've ever used the with function in base R, there's like a with function where, um, so you can say with empty cars, plus miles per gallon and it'll calculate based on that whereas you you can't just do still plus and miles per gallon because it doesn't know where still and miles per gallon are so the width is a is a base r function um but it's kind of like mutate in my head i'm sure there's important differences but in my head that's kind of how it works um uh, so if we wanted to create our own little with function, we would again have to use the an expression because it's within it's inside that 
the expression we're passing is going through a function and needs to then be captured indirectly. So we're going to give it a data frame. This is your nice uh, tidyverse uh, order of operations with data always comes first. And then you have your expression. We're going to um, capture that expression and then evaluate it with tidy about given that data set. And this is the exact kind of same thing we were doing up there, it just like within the context of a function we created. But there's a bug with doing it this way um, because it evaluates inside of this function with two, but this expression x plus y, probably if you were to write this, um, x plus y to you could um, refer to objects in your environment. So in the, if we were to look at it from this perspective, let's say we had a data frame with um, x as a column, and we had an object in our environment called a that was worth that was worth ten. <laughs> Sorry, that was ten. We would might want to say, okay, with this data frame, add um, a to x. But if we had a inside of that function, a would refer in this example here. A would refer to everything that was inside the function, and not what was in the user's environment. So for me, I always think of it as like the user environment, but the parent environment or the global environment. So we would actually get a response, like a result that makes like no sense. Um, from the perspective of whoever's running that function. So this was actually, this little example is actually part of the next section, but I thought it made sense to kind of like think about it here because now we can talk about how fixing that. So now we can use quotures to um, uh, kind of fix this problem. And I, I had always heard the word quotures, like it comes up a lot if you ever try to do tidy evaluation. Um, inside of like a package and things like that, but I had never really understood at all what it was. <laughs> and now I'm like, all of a sudden, they just, this the simple phrase, closures bundles the expression with an environment. I was like, huh. And um, I feel like that might have been my epiphany, Joe, for this chapter um, was exactly what the hell a closure actually is. Um, so a closure, um, allows you to use, sorry, to use a quotient, we're going to use instead of, instead of an expression, we're going to use end quote. So we're going to enclosure it. So we take an expression, we enclosure it, we can pass it to, um, uh, to tidy, uh, we can evaluate it in the context of the data frame. And now that expression is in quote, enclosured with respect to wherever it was sort of created. In this case, it's created in the parent environment by the user. So now we get a much more sensible result, uh, like, you know, from the perspective of whoever's calling that function. It makes a lot more sense that if you're calling that function with X and A, that it comes from this parent environment. So if you're ever using a data mask, you always want to use enclosure and never an expression. And that also made sense for me because I have used enclosure before in the past. Um, in, in the sense of like trying to get something to work and then it finally eventually works and you don't really know why, but you're not going to mess with it because it finally worked. Uh, but I'd never used an, an expression before. And I think that's just because you don't use an expression in the context of a data mask, which is almost 100, probably 99% of the times which I've done this. So we're going to come back to that in a couple weeks in chapter 20. Can, can we stay on this for one second? Yeah, we got lots of time and it's a really short chapter. So this is good. Okay, so... It bundles it with an environment. Mm -hmm. Where it was created. Right, so, that's the piece I'm struggling with. So you're saying this is created in my global environment because I ran that line of code in my global environment? So here, this is creating the expression X plus A. And the in quo here is saying, um, bundle that expression with the environment where it was created. Yeah, I'm totally cool with that piece, like bundle in the environment where it's created. I totally get that. I just don't get where it's created. Like, I don't really understand why X plus A is created in the global environment. Like, because what is its creation? Um, and this, I think, gets... I might not be using the right terminology. I, I use, like, I kind of make up my own expressions sometimes for how things work in my head. Um, so this, uh, so I think one of you just said it's created in the call of the function. Yeah. So this is the function call. In here. the call of the function. So and the function's being called in your global environment. 
So I feel like when we covered functions, we covered a couple of like kind of weird or environments at the beginning here. We covered Mm -hmm. examples where depending when you send a, you know, create an expression or call um, something, it it kind of, you get some weird results. Does anyone else remember that? Or Jeffrey, what were you going to say? Well, I was going to say, I think this is where we want to think about it as current environment rather than global environment. Global environment is a very specific yes, exactly. location, whereas yeah, the current you. environment is whatever that environment that the function yeah. is called. Because you could run this in another function. Right. You could run this in a Quarto document, right? And right. they have their own environments there. <clears throat> so I think that's important just to kind of keep in yeah. mind. It's not going to show up in your global environment like settings over on, on, on our studio necessarily <clears throat> unless you're running it in that you know particular situation exactly yeah so joe was that kind of yeah that was helpful i think it's going to take a little um percolating to really get what's going on but that was that was helpful thank you but i guess the, the important thing is it's not the <clears throat> the internal function environment excuse me that's where that error occurred because yeah. it was it was focused it was using it on the internal function environment not the current environment that the function is being kind of used in it's not the yeah the function of the evaluation environment it's the parent environment um i was just trying to think about something else i wish it was also when we were doing function factories i think we kind of had some weird things in there too um so I have a question uh, in that example. So if you don't define the A in your global environment, the, the A uh, equals 10. Oh, the call, the call with two, is it gonna take the A value in the 1,000 or 10,000? Or this, th- that one? Um, or is it gonna throw an error? I think this one, I actually have an A, so let's get rid of that. I think this one will error because we've told it to bundle it with, we've said this expression gets bundled with the parent environment or the environment where it was created. Um, and that's a good question about whether or not, how far up does it go? So if we actually create it even further up, would it get bundled with that one or with the parent? Anyway, sorry, that's another question, but it's something maybe to think about. This one, we've told it the environment is not this environment. So I think if we don't have A, we'll have an error. Let's see. Object A not found. Um, I also kind of think that if we don't have this A in here, it will use whichever A it can find. So if we were to use an expression here um, and we had no A here, but we would have had an A here. That would also be fine. Um, if we went like this, that would be fine. And if we went like this, and I'm gonna get rid of A now. I've got no A here. If we do this, whoops. So in this case, it's it will keep searching up. It looks like it looks for it here, and if it doesn't find it here, it goes into the parent environment and things like that. So when you in quote enclosure it or enclose it, um, you are being very you're pinning down that environment is how I think of it. At least I think so. Although now I'm yes. curious as to how far up that pin goes. Um, where exactly can this be created? Anyway, that I think we maybe if we have time at the end, I can play with that. But um, yeah, we're getting. Oh, is actually no, I think we're done. Sorry, we are done. That was it. Um, so maybe now I can play with that. I'm just. Does anyone understand or what I'm talking about when I'm kind of curious about where up the chain that comes? So. Stephanie, I'm going to, I'm going to head off because I got to run and do something, but um, I am curious about this. So maybe I'll look back at the, at the video and thank you. This was incredibly helpful and it helps me a lot for next week. So I'm looking forward to next week. Thanks for uh, awesome, doing awesome presentation. See you guys all next week. Bye. Thank you. So this would be an quo. And what if we had one function? Yeah. Okay, here. This is, I think, and we're going to do with two. Um, 
PF X plus A plus N. Okay, okay. All right, so I'm gonna make these two functions here to make sure there's no A just in case. And now I'm going to use fun one. Yeah, I don't have to give it anything else. And we get what we expect. Actually, let's do and sorry. Sorry, just to kind of track where things are being run. All right, so if we Oh, I think that does answer the question. Yeah, so the expression is created in here. And therefore, this A is the one that's pinned to it with the in quote. Um, what happens if I get rid of that A here? Now, it actually went up to the upper. Oh, that's scary, though. <laughs> I'm not sure I love that one. Um, interesting. And then if we said expression, I'm kind of expression. I think the problem is this one is actually being evaluated at this point. And so we would actually have to do end quo here. Hmm. <laughs> or, oh, I don't, I think I'm making, I'm not sure actually what's happening now. Let's see what happens if I do. Um, you can ignore these messages. I get them on my computer all the time, and I wish I knew exactly why. Um, so we're looking at the expression here. Oh, I don't think we would enclose it here now. Oh, yeah, and so it's got the environment. So the, this one is being pinned to the global environment here. Yeah. Okay. So there was a little bit of weirdness where if we couldn't find the A, it kind of went up in a level, but it looks like wherever that expression, you, you can't really pass an expression to another function without somehow capturing it or enclosing it. So it kind of is irrelevant because if we enclose it here, then it's capturing that environment up there. Does that make sense? Okay, maybe. <laughs> yeah, this is where I run into problems where I've been trying to work with data masking, where the um, my solution to doing this is to create functions that take columns, column names as character, because I hate dealing with this. <laughs> and you can always deal with tidyverse functions now with character by just putting in the dot data, um, you know, square bracket, square bracket notation. Um, but I had one, I was working for a client and the client really wanted like, you know, proper data masking in the function, but passing that down to several different layers was really complicated because I like to use check functions to like check that everything's present and, and correct. And I feel like this was, I think if I better, if I had a better understanding of this, it would have made, it would have been a lot easier. So in this case, because the expression is actually generated in the global environment, your current working environment, mm -hmm. that's why it used that 10,000 A it yes. is 10,000 as opposed to the 10 or 1,000 because those are separate functional environments, but the expression was generated in the global. I believe so, yeah. And it's not, as far as I can say, in this context, it's not possible to use an expression down several layers without enclosing enclose, it before you pass it on. I 
I had an idea of one thing I wanted to check again. Oh yeah, so I was kind of curious. Um, if we do it here, I'm gonna do the browser again. Um, I love browser for like kind of troubleshooting things. It's really nice because you, Uh, do you mean, sorry, Derek, these exact examples that we're working on here? Yeah, as we continue to talk about uh, where these are evaluated with the parent environment and all. Yeah, okay. So I'm in here. Object X not found. Oh, right, and quote X plus, oh, right, right, sorry, we have to do quote X plus A. No, in quote, sorry. Expression. And the environment is the, I'm assuming that's the key for the environment of the fun one execution. Yeah, I mean, we used to have, I know he, he gave us a previously a function that could find that environment, but I forgot what it what it is, but we could double check it by I think there's like a, a lobster function or one of the other packages has a function that could tell us what fun one's environment code would look like. Oh, yeah. That's way at the beginning, still, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's really, like maybe it was in the environment, <clears throat> the environment chapter seven or whatever. Anyway, yeah. I think that, yeah, we could double, double check that, but I think you're right. Well, Derek, I already found a typo in my slides and I wasn't going to fix it. But uh, if uh, if you think these would be good examples, I'll throw them in and then uh, ask John to merge them in um, with my typo fix. I think it's a print, but I'm not sure. I'm free. No, but that one requires the environment. And it must have been another package. It is like the oh. reference. Yeah. But also so it would different... be a... not, I think this one is something that is a bit ephemeral, right? Like it only exists when that function is run. It's like the execution environment of that function, right? So I don't think it lasts. I feel like this is like uh, making my brain hurt a little. So did anyone have any other questions or things you want to explore about you know, where these things come and go? And No, this was great. Thank you so much, Stephen. Yeah, very helpful. Very helpful for sorting, sorting this out. Yeah, I'm excited to see how the next couple of weeks go. Um, so do we, um, so I'll say, I'll say end, I think. <laughs>